Okay, well, we're studying, of course, the pro book of the prophet Isaiah, and we're in session six, and we're going to undertake two chapters, but they are very, very uh, pregnant with uh, insight. It's, uh, it's one of the things you quickly be, uh, get acquainted with, is that Isaiah really embraces much more than what we normally think of as prophecy, and it's very, far, very eloquent, very far-reaching. And the challenges of this session, this, this two ch these two chapters we're going to take on, we're going to talk about the fall of Babylon, and what makes that a little remarkable is that Isaiah will be talking about its fall from its peak a hundred years before it rises to power. Many people overlook that when they read the book. So the fall of Babylon is going to be in our focus. But we're also going to talk, and it's, it's, its rise will be also detailed when we get later on in chapter 39. Of course, it's in 2 Kings 20 and other passages. But we're also going to discern something that is usually confused with the fall of Babylon, and that's the ultimate doom of Babylon. And I want to show you why those are distinctively different and how indebted we are uh, to not only Isaiah, but also Jeremiah to highlight something that's going to be dominant in our time, long, long after the, the, the years it was written. And there's a third element that we'll touch on lightly to make you aware of the differences, and that's the mystery of Babylon, which, is, which shows up in the book of Revelation. And these topics get confused, so we'll talk a little bit about that. The mystery of Babylon turns, turns out to be one of those metaphors, that you, along with Assyria, that's used metaphorically of the enemies of God in whatever period we're talking about and that we'll encounter that as we go. But we're also going to encounter a very remarkable passage sort of tucked into chapter 14, which deals with the origin and career of one called Lucifer. And we'll deal with that when we get there. So we're, our, this, the range of topics we're going to encounter tonight is rather unusually broad. We'll try to do the best we can as we go here. And what we're going to do, which is going to be our style, we're going to introduce each segment with its quote from the International Standard Version Bible, which is just out and leans heavily on the, on the, uh, the expertise of Dr. Peter Flint, who is the acknowledged expert of the great Isaiah scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, so what we find from the ISV particularly is a flow that's a lot smoother than the King James, and you will get a sense of the eloquence of Isaiah that we sometimes miss when we, break, when we break the text down verse by verse. So let's just take the first five verses of chapter 13 in the ISV, as just read it through to get a flavor here. Verse 1, a message that Amos' son Isaiah received about Babylon. Raise a banner on a bare hilltop, cry out loud to them. Give a wave of the hand, signaling for them to enter the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones. I have also summoned my warriors, those who rejoice in my triumph, to carry out my angry judgments. This is God speaking through Isaiah. Listen, there's a noise on the mountains like that of a great multitude. Listen, there's an uproar among the kingdoms like that of nations massing together. The Lord of the heavenly armies is mustering an army for battle. They're coming from a faraway land, from a distant horizon the Lord and the weapons of His anger, to destroy the entire land." Wow! That gives you the flavor of these opening five, uh, uh, five verses. And we'll examine it in detail in the King James for a lot of reasons. Um, but uh, let's just read it in the way it would read in your King James Bible. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see, lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I want you, to, when it says burden, the term is mas in the Hebrew, it's a prophecy of impending judgment. You'll find that phrase all through the scriptures. And uh, it continues in verse 3, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. Get this, God, this is God mustering his troops, if you will, and uh, uh, his sanctified ones. And so, Continuing verse 4, the noise of the multitude in the mountains like, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustered, mustereth the host of the battle. And uh, I want you to notice the, the plural, plural there. This isn't one nation conquering Babylon, it's, it's a group of nations 
That's interesting and often missed. It's, it's a plural. And uh, since it describes a plurality of kingdoms, and, and it will include the Medes, by the way, that'll show up in verse 17, and the Medes are known today as the Kurds. Because it makes reference to the Medes, many assume it refers to history that's already been fulfilled back in 539. But we're going to quickly discover that this goes far beyond what really happened back there in 539 B.C. <clears throat> and we're going to analyze this and realize that the destruction that is here predicted has yet to happen is my premise. I don't want you to accept that. I just want you to be aware of that possibility and, and come to your own conclusions as you study the text. They come from a far country from the end of heaven. Really? Even the Lord and the weapons of His indignation to destroy what? The whole land. This is big stuff happening. This isn't the fall of a little city. There's something much bigger going on here. And uh, so, uh, and uh, the, the fall uh, of Babylon to the Medes and the Persians in 539 B.C. is well recorded in history. But when you study it, you'll discover it happened without a battle. That's all in Daniel chapter 5, by the way, for those of you who want to dig into that. But the details here do not fit the, uh, the history. So let's take a look at the next sec section in the ISV, verses 6 through 9. Wail out loud, because the day of the Lord is near. There's an interesting phrase. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, every hand will go limp. Every man's courage will melt. They will be terrified. Pain and anguish will seize them. They'll rise like a woman in labor. They'll look aghast at one another, and their faces will be ablaze with fear. Watch out! The day of the Lord is coming cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to turn the entire inhabited earth into a desolation and to annihilate sinners from it. Wow! This is heavy stuff, right? Well, let's look at it in the King James. You'll see that the, 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 they, they don't really differ. I think the ISV gives you a little more of the flavor of the flow of Isaiah's thought, but the details are, in, in my mind, uh, uh, more closely as we take it, we unpack it verse by verse. Verse 6, How will ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Let that sink in. That's a heavy thing. The day of the Lord, that's an expression all through the Scripture, in Joel and other places. Uh, you'll find it in Haggai 2, and Hebrews 12, and Zechariah 14, and many other places. The day of the Lord, that's the final judgment upon the earth, if you will. And we're going to have that amplified here in verse 9 as we go forward here. The, the, comes a destruction from the Almighty. You know, that term is a very strange term for a prophet to use. We use it a lot, but the prophets use it very rarely, strangely enough. Therefore shall all hands be faint, every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them, and they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth, and they shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. It's interesting to me, this term, like a woman that travaileth, it's amazing how frequently that shows up in prophetic uh, uh, passages. In Isaiah 21, Jeremiah 31, Psalm 48, and very significantly in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, even in the New Testament. This, this time of anguish we're seeing, the time of Jacob's trouble, the, the great tribulation, is often done parallel, idiomatically that is, to a woman in travail. It's interesting how often that comes up. But continue verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Wow. Okay. The day of the Lord. And again, that's a, that, that very key phrase that's being used here. The land is going to lay the land desolate. That, that has not, ha we'll discover, has not uh, happened, Chris. I'll give you a summary of this all later. And uh, so... Let's take the next uh, four verses in the ISV to get a flavor of what's going here. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations won't shine their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon won't shine its light. I'll punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I'll put an end to the prophecy of the arrogant and overthrow the insolence of the tyrants. I'll make people scarcer than pure gold and mankind rarer than gold from Ophir. Therefore, I'll make the heavens tremble. The earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord of the heavenly armies at the time of his burning anger. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I think the, uh, 
The ISV captures the flow it pretty, pretty aggressively. Let's, take, let's unpack it piece by piece. Verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in their, its going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. The word constellation there, by the way, uh, and by the way, the, the, this, the, the scope of all this is in a lot of verses, but you can chase those down on your own. Uh, and so we'll move on here. But the word constellation is actually Orion's in the Hebrew. And uh, that was worshipped by Nimrod and his tower in the heavens and Babel and all that. And so there, there's the, 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 these idioms are, are familiar to you if you know your Old Testament passages. But let's move on to verse 11. God says, I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Wow. You know, it's interesting how we notice all through the Bible how God hates pride because we're going to discover why he hates it when we get to chapter 14. It's going to re reveal that to us. But obviously God's going to punish the world. And I'm going to suggest to you the flavor of the language is vastly broader in scope than just the events that occurred in 539 B.C. when Cyrus the Persian and his, his generals slipped under the, and took over the city of Babylon. They took it, they, they took, took it without a battle. And uh, we're going to get into that when we get to the next unit in Isaiah. And I'll show, I'll show you a replica of the famous steel of Cyrus that's in the London Museum where he brags that he was able to capture Babylon without a battle. So 539, yes, it fell to the Persians, but not with a the battle. They just took it over by, by subterfuge. And so this hasn't happened. And here we're dealing with the pride of Assyria and of Moab and so forth. And we're going to see the ultimate pride is going to surface in the next chapter. That's where we're going to learn why God really hates pride as we go forward here. But let's pick up verse 12 and 13. I will make man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. And uh, therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place. The earth will remove out of her place. Wow. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts, in the day of his fierce anger. And that's another idiom, if you will, for the day of the Lord in contrast to the day of man. It's every man for himself, in a sense. Well, let's pick up the next few verses on the ISV. They will be like, hunted, like a hunted gazelle, like a sheep with no one to gather them. Each will turn to his own people, and each will flee to his own land. Whoever is captured will be thrust through, and whoever is caught will fall dead, killed by the sword. Their infants will be dashed to pieces before their eyes, and their houses will be looted, and their wives slept with. That's the ISV rendering. It's clearly we're dealing with a bloody takeover here. And it shall be as the chaste roe, and a sheep that hath no man taketh it up. They shall every man turn to his own people, and flee every one to his own land. Every one that is found shall be thrust through, and every one that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. So there's no real big variance from the King James, but I think the ISV does give us a flow that's a little bit more easier. Their children shall also be dashed to pieces before their eyes, their houses shall be spoiled, and their wives ravished. And uh, so we see cruelty, and, and all these have echoes from other passages. You can dig those out of your notes because we're going to keep moving here. In verse 17, we're going to shift to uh, uh, talking about Babylon falling here. The ISV says, watch out. I'm stirring up the Medes against them, and who care nothing for silver, and take no delight in gold. Their bows will dash the young men to pieces, they'll show no pity on those not yet born, and their eyes will not spare children. Babylon, that jewel of kingdoms, the splendor and pride of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. No Bedouin will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. Wow. So we're at verse 17 of chapter 13. Let's take a look at it in the King James. He says, Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold they shall not delight in it. The allusion here to the Medes is what derails many of the commentators, because obviously the Medes teamed with the Persians in conquering Babylon in 539. In those days, the Medes were very dominant. We'll get into the politics of all of that when we deal with it in more detail later in Isaiah. But uh, so Medes were a, a, key, a key factor. 
Because of the involvement of the Medes, many people assume that what's being recorded here is the fall of Babylon in 539. But if you study that at all, you suddenly realize what's, being, what's in view here is something that has not happened yet. And that's the point that I want you to carry away from this study and, and, and verify through your own uh, review. And so the Medes are, are uh, the people, that they, they, were allies of, they were allies of Babylon against Assyria back in those days. And they allied with the Persians who were going to conquer Babylon in 539. But today they're known as the Kurds, and they're presently hostile towards Iraq, as you may know. And so these are also mentioned in Jeremiah 51 and 2 Kings 17. Their bows shall dash their young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of their womb. Their eyes shall not spare the children. Now, the, the bows, are speaking of bows and arrows, obviously, but the, the, the skill, they were the primary weaponry of that day, and it was a chief weapon. Herodotus points out that every youth was to learn to ride, draw a bow, and speak the truth. Those were the fundamental things you learned as you grew up. To ride, to draw a bow, and speak the truth. And that's what made the, uh, the uh, Magogians so terrified because they learned their trademark was that they could uh, bring a bird down in flight, right or left handed, while they're at a gallop. And no one has ever equaled their skills. The Parthians uh, tried, but no one, they're, they're legendary. But the point is, the bow is, that's idiomatic of, of, uh, of uh, weaponry, if you will. And so, anyway. Verse 19, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to, in your reading assignments, you were to read four, six chapters, and I'll show you those in summary in a later chart. But Isaiah 13 and 14 is parallel with Jeremiah 15 51, and we'll look at that in the chart form here in a little bit. But I want you to notice something. Both Isaiah and Jeremiah parallel this destruction in Babylon with Sodom and Gomorrah. They both use that phrase. Now let's stop and realize what that means. Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed suddenly. Not just drifted away, it was destroyed like in an hour kind of thing. And it was never again rebuilt. Sodom and Gomorrah was not it became a tell or other people built. No, no. They're out of history. They're, from, they're, they're famous for that. Totally destroyed, totally ended, never again to rise up. And both Sodom and Gomorrah, that fray, that idiom, if you will, is used both by Isaiah and Jeremiah in dealing with Babylon. And I'm going to show you why that isn't true today for some interesting reasons. It says the Chaldees excellently, and that's the southern part of that country, of course. And of course, the Sodom and Gomorrah thing is the key thought I want you to remember. I'm going to point out that this has not happened yet. It will be sudden, and it'll never again be restored after that. And we'll emphasize that later, but I want you to pick up that as we go here. And in fact, Isaiah continues on in verse 20 here. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. See, that condition has not happened to Babylon. You can go visit it today as a, as a tourist attraction. So what it's saying here, you've got, you got a problem. Either it's just an allegorical, metaphorical passage, or if you, believe, if you believe God means what He says and says what He means, what is described here hasn't happened yet. That's going to be very important as we go on. Never be inhabited. And, uh, and that's in Isaiah 13, it's in Isaiah 14, it's in Jeremiah 50, in verse 13, 26, and 39, and Jeremiah 51, in 26, 29, and 37. In other words, this isn't an interpretive remark, a perspective that is unique to us. No, that's what the text clearly hammers home in a number of places. Okay. When Kaldui was the famous German archaeologist, when he excavated Babylon in the 19th century, he was able to hire local residents to help him in his archaeological work. Years later, obviously, not long ago, Saddam Hussein spent hundreds of millions of dollars over several decades rebuilding the key buildings. You see, that's it, it, total, in total violence of what the scripture describes, okay? Which, and by the way, during the Persian Gulf War, 
Babylon was shown on their knuckle charts as numerous large buildings, about 14 miles south of El Hala, about 62 miles south of Baghdad. It was not a military target during the Persian Gulf War. Okay, so let's go on and see what the ISV says from verse 21 and 22. But desert beasts will lie down there, and their houses will be full of howling creatures. Their owls will dwell, and goat demons will dance there. Hyenas will howl in its strongholds, and jackals will make their dens in its citadels. Its time is close at hand, and its days will not be extended any further. Okay, that's the ISV. Let's see what the King James says. In the English of the King James, says, But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. And owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. Now we've got some translational options here you need to understand. The, the Hebrew for doleful creatures can just suggest a howling animal. Okay, no problem there. The, the word translated owls is actually a term for un unclean bird. It's literally translated as daughters of the owl, perhaps an extinct bird. Its exact meaning in the Hebrew is not known. So these are guesses by translators as to what word to put in there, okay? And satyrs is a word for a hairy, rough, long-haired ones, a he-goat, or a goat demon. So one of the things you have to get used to is these terms can refer to certain animals, but they're also used as figures of speech for demons. So it's your, it's your choice how you want to parse the, uh, the translation just regarding these as wild animals, okay, fine, or if they're idioms for something more than that. And I want to remind you of the demon-possessed um, uh, 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 swine in, in the Gadara in the New Testament and so forth. And so um, that, that you can go either way. But these terms that we're seeing here were used of demons in Leviticus 17.7 and 2 Chronicles 11.15. So, if you lean the, in, in, the spook, in the direction of spookiness, then uh, you're justified. If you're uncomfortable with that, you can just regard them as, you know, creatures, and we'll let it go and move on here. The next verse, though, says, And the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. And of course, it's talking about the city of Babylon there. And so... These wild beasts, howling creatures, that's why some people translate it like hyenas, which they're howling creatures, and others, they, they, they shriek here apparently. And the dragons is a term in the Hebrew for serpents or sea monsters. It also can refer, strangely, for jackals. So you can, you have your choice in a translation to decide on, on the scale of spookiness how far you want to go. And, uh, but uh, that's up to you. But let's move now to the next session, which is the next chapter, 14. And we're going to see where Israel mocks Babylon's king. Now we're going to see, as we get into chapter 14, we're going to talk about the king of Babylon. But we're also going to discover that the writer, the Isaiah, or God I should say, will reach behind that king and talk about the power behind him. And that, that'll throw you when you get to verse 12. Let's start right here. Verse 1. However, the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will once again choose Israel. He will settle them in their own land, and foreigners will join them, affiliating themselves with the house of Jacob. Many nations will take them and bring them to their land and their own place. Really? The house of Israel will put those nations to conscripted labor in the Lord's hand, land. They will take captive those who were their captors and will rule continually over those who oppress them. And this is from that verse in the English, is that taking captivity captive, where the people that were captured take the people over that were capturing. And that's a strange term that we'll see in here shortly. In the, in the uh, uh, King James English, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. The strangers shall be joined to them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And, uh, and the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel will possess them in the land of the Lord for the servants and handmaids, and shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and shall rule over their oppressors. And uh, so taking, taking them captives, whose captives they were. And I'm not going to, to, to spend a lot of time on this here, because we've got too many other things to deal with, but I want you to notice the phrase, led, led captivity captive, 
and and uh, look at the um, expositions you'll find on Ephesians 4:8, Psalm 68:18, and uh, uh, understand that this leads into a whole area of study as to what Christ did between in the three days that he was in the tomb. And uh, I don't want to get that to derail this discussion by getting into that here. Just footnote this and double back on it in your. It's a very provocative verse here in Isaiah 14, verse 2, but we'll move on. Because it has to do with Satan being defeated, and that, of course, your, your verses are there, Hebrews 2.14 and Colossians 2.14 and 15, for those that want to take that off as a topical study. But let's jump, keep in verse, look at verse 3 to 7 in the ISV. At the time when the Lord gives you rest from your suffering turmoil and the cruel bondage which they forced you to serve, you will lift up this song of mockery against the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has come to an end, how the attacker has ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers that struck down the peoples in anger with unceasing blows, that oppressed nations in fury with relentless persecution. The entire earth is at rest and peace, its inhabitants break into song. Well, you can say, gee, this is that, that actually is all in here to give the Isra Israelis encouragement while they're enduring the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And that's very legitimate, except you've got to put it all in perspective. This encouragement to the captives was essential over a hundred years later. At the time Isaiah is writing this, Babylon had not risen to power, hadn't become the, Babel, the, the, the captor of Judah and taking them captive for those 70 years of captivity that they eventually return. And so that's all yet to come. That's all yet future. Isaiah is going to talk about it a hundred years before it's necessary. And Isaiah will, God will include in Isaiah a letter calling Cyrus by name that when Cyrus is confronted with that, it blows him away. When he conquers the strange city, Babylon, and all that, Daniel presents to him this letter in Isaiah written 150 years before Cyrus was born and calls him by name, and God says, because I'm calling you by name, you'll know that I'm the God of Israel, and so forth. And Cyrus is so impressed, he releases them to go back, and it's, it's a tremendous story we're going to get into, but this is all anticipatory here. Okay, let's get back to the English here in verse 3. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow, and from thy fear, and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. See, that's all yet future. Thou shalt, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted, and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. So very poetically described, but it's words of comfort to the Jews when they're in captivity, which is after Babylon rises to power, which hasn't happened yet. Isn't that wild? Really wild when you realize that. Let's go to verse 8 in the, in the, King, in the ISV. Even the cypresses rejoice over you, as do the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Now that you've been laid low, no woodcutter comes up against us. The afterlife below is all astir to meet you when you arrive. He's talking about the king of Babylon getting into Shoal. The people in Shoal are anxious to see him. Weird. Isn't that weird? The afterlife below is all astir to meet you when you arrive. It rouses up the spirits of the dead to greet you, everyone who used to be world leaders. It has raised up from their thrones all who used to be kings of the nations. Boy, this paints a strange picture of Sheol, doesn't it? In answer, all of them will tell you, you've also become as weak as we are. You have become just like us. Your pomp has been brought down to Sheol along with the noise of your harps. Maggots are spread out beneath you and worms are your covering. Wow! What a strange, strange passage. And, uh, well, see, the King James, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. See, this is addressed to the king of Babylon, remember now. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. See, this leads to a strange, you, you can say, well, this is just poetic language, maybe. 
Or does that imply that the kings that are down in Sheol, some have some kind of thrones? That's too, too weird, you know? And of course, hell here is at Sheol. That's the domain. Of, don't confuse, uh, many translators mis, mis, mistake Sheol and grave. They're different Hebrew, words in the Hebrew. Graves are physical. They can be in the plural, more than one, and they can be owned by a person. They're tangible. And that's the domain of the dead body. Don't confuse that with Sheol, which is always singular, never plural. It's not owned by anybody. It's always described idiomatically as if it's in the center of the earth. It's the domain of the departed spirits. When you die, your body goes to the grave, your spirit goes to Sheol, is the idea. Good or bad. Because at this time it has two compartments. The good half and the bad half. The good half is called Abraham's bosom in, one, in another passage in Luke 16. And uh, the rest is waiting for the, the great white throne and the rest. Anyway, so Sheol is the d d domain of the departed spirits. It stirs up the dead for thee. The word is actually Rephaim, which is shades or giants in many other passages or in feeble ones in other passages. Strange term, the Rephaim, you want to be caught. When it says dead, you want to be careful. If the Rephaim, it can mean any of several things. It can be in, uh, Nephilim, for example, sometimes. And all, even all the chief ones of the earth. And uh, the word there is for is actually he goats. So again, it's a demonic term. And so uh, chief ones here in the in, in their ch chief ones of the earth, but they're, they're they're demons and hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. Wow, all they that speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become as weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of the vials, and the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Here's where the metaphors get commingled. Because obviously the grave and the maggots and all that are physical in contrast to Sheol, but idiom, idiomatically they're, 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 they're merged here, which can, be, can cause confusion if you're not sensitive to that. But now we get to verse 12. In Isaiah 14, verse 12, we encounter a, a shift of focus because God is speaking through Isaiah, but he's, he's refocusing himself on a different addressee. How, how you have fallen from heaven, day star. And that's the way the ISV people have chosen to translate the word Lucifer. But how you have fallen from heaven, day star, son of the dawn. How you have been thrown down to earth, you who laid low the nation. You said in your heart, now, up till now you could say he's still talking to the king of Babylon, but you quickly discover what he's starting to talk about here goes far beyond the, the person of, uh, that, that served as king of the Babylon here. Verse 13, you said in your heart, I'll ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I'll erect my throne. I'll sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I'll ascend over the tops of the clouds. I'll make myself like the most high. That's the close quote. But you are brought down to join the dead to the far reaches of the pit. Well, okay, so far, okay, but this is going to get worse, so I want to just alert you to that. The, the ver in the King James, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? And I'm going to suggest to you the perspective. You, don't, you need to develop your own. Many of us take the perspective that what God is doing here, he's shifting from the literal king of Babylon to the power that's behind him. And we're dealing with Satan here. And that becomes clearer as we go for, for, uh, uh, further here. Lucifer is a, a, a fallen from heaven. Where did he fall from? From heaven, not from the throne room of Babylon. And uh, so, for thou hast, now, it, it, this is the accusation given to the, the, the person that's addressed here. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. These are the famous five I wills in the English translation. In the, uh, I like the ISV's flow, but the ISV doesn't get that punch of these five I wills here. I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sites of the north. I will ascend to the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. 
The guy aspiring here is going, pl trying to be like God. Now, what's, in, what's being laid out here is unbridled ambition. Unbridled ambition. And uh, the five I wills. Like the Most High is often interpreted to be God by other interpreters, but to be close or equivalent to God. And the suggestion is made that Satan or Lucifer saw Adam and he was created as a rival to be compromised. And that's why he took the trouble to get Adam to fall, because he saw him as a rival. That's a view held by some theologians. And uh, uh, so we, we do know, as we study the topic of Satan in the Bible, that he was, he in, was involved in a rebellion in heaven. He didn't fall alone. From Revelation 12 we learn a third of the angels fell with him. And so we need to understand from John 8, 44 and 1 Timothy 3, 6 and so forth, there was a rebellion. And he was not alone in that rebellion. You've got a string of verses there in your workbooks. 2 Peter 2 and Revelation 12 and Genesis 6, Jude 6 and Ephesians 6, of course, that, uh, that uh, this, is, this, is who, this is our adversary. And he's not alone. He has resources. And uh, so that is what's now, uh, laid out here. And... Uh, but Isaiah continues here, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, or Sheol, to the sides of the pit. Now I'm going to depart here, you put a bookmark in your mind there, because we're going to shift to a similar passage in Ezekiel chapter 28. We're in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. You can easily remember those two chapter labels here. And we're going to go take a look at these two critical passages. We've been in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 21 so far. We're going to take a look at Ezekiel 28, verse 11 to 19, and you'll see the same thing is occurring there. And uh, uh, in each, the local context is transcended to focus on the power behind the thrones. In Isaiah, the throne is Babylon. In Ezekiel, it's the throne of Tyre. The king of Tyre is the target here. But in verse, Ezekiel 28, starting at verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Well, already, even before this thing starts, you get sort of stumble here, because he's attributing to this guy he's calling the king of Tyrus, that you're the ultimate in wisdom and beauty. That's quite an appellation. Wow, really? And uh, so... Is, is this guy the ultimate of wisdom and beauty? No, the guy that God is dealing with was. So it's not the king of Tyre as we would meet him, it's the power behind him. And let's watch and see what he says here in verse 13. God speaking to him in effect. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The guy being addressed here is, was in Eden, the garden of God. There's only three people we know of that were in that garden. Adam and Eve, of course, and the Nachash, the shining one. That's who we're dealing with here. And it's described, these, these semi-precious stones are ways of describing light. That's a, that's, a, that's a classic idiom for colored lights, all these different colors. And that, that the workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared. We infer that his music was fantastic. But notice, they were prepared in the, in the day that thou wast created. He was a created being. And we're going to discover who he was in the next verse. But understand, he is a created being. The king of Tyrus wasn't created. He was an offspring of, you know, uh, uh, Adam ultimately. Well, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. He was a created being. Okay, key points. Verse 14, 15. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect. In the days from the day that thou wast created until, oh, what a sad word that is, until iniquity was found in thee. That's where it started. 
It all started in the heart of Lucifer. Through pride. That's why God hates pride. That's where the roots of it. Thou art the anointed cherub that covered. Now we've talked a little bit about cherubs. We know there are certain kinds of super angels. Isaiah talked about seraphs. We talked about, we studied that when we got back there in chapter 6. Cherubs are also somehow, and cherubim is the plural, cherub is singular. And dismiss from your perception these silly idioms from a Renaissance art. They have these funny little babies with wings, and they, what they call cherubs has got nothing to do with what they appear in the scripture. Cherubs in the scripture are terrifying. They are God's enforcers, typically. They were the ones that guarded the way to the Garden of Eden, uh, yeah, and so forth. But here, the gun he's talking to was the anointed cherub that covereth. Clumsy English, maybe for most of us. He was the cherub that was in charge of everything else. You are the anointed cherub that covereth. In other words, not only is he one of these super angels, he was number one, numero uno. He's the guy that ran things. He probably led the worship, strangely enough. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou wast up and down the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. Man. See, he was in charge. And he rebelled. He wanted, he wanted it all. And a third left with him, apparently. In verse 16, by the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. And we're dealing with, obviously, <laughs> trans-dimensional issues here. I'm not gonna, the, the, the metaphors, I'm sure, are very inadequate to describe it all. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Boy. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. Oh, really? Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. I know what Walter Martin would probably insert here with a smile on his face. He's going to make an ash of himself. <laughs> but we'll move on. Okay. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Wow. Heavy stuff here. Well, that's going to, okay, that, that, that's the passage from Ezekiel 28. As you can easily see, we could take the few verses from Isaiah and the few verses from um, Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, and do a study several hours worth, really, and, and we do that, by the way, in a thing called the, the uh, origin of evil, and, uh, uh, and it's, it's one of our supporting studies for the Kingdom, Power, and Glory book that my wife and I published. So you can get into that and really study more about that. I wanted to emphasize enough so you're aware of it, I didn't want to derail this whole study just for that topic. Let's move on here. Those who see you will stare at you. They will wonder at you. This is the man that made the earth to tremble, who made the kingdoms quake, who made the world like a desert, who destroyed its cities, really, who would not open the jails for his prisoners. All the kings of the nations lie in state, each in his own tomb, but you are cast away from your grave like a repulsive branch. Your clothing is the slain, those pierced by the sword, those who go down to the pit like a dead body trampled underfoot. Oh boy. Let's see what the English says in, in Isaiah. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? That did shake the kingdoms? That made the world as a wilderness? That destroyed the cities thereof? That opened not the house of his prisoners? Wow, that raises all kinds of questions, speculations of what is it referring to? I'll let you do that in your discussion groups. That made the world as a wilderness? Destroyed the cities thereof? What is he talking about here? That open not the house of his prisoners. Then it continues, And all the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, everyone in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, 
as the raiment of those that are slain thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under feet. See, even in the stilted King James, it, it flows. <laughs> Boy. ISV continues, you will not be united with them in burial, for you have destroyed your land and have slain your people. People will never mention the descendants of those who practice evil again. Prepare a massacre for his sons because of the guilt of their forefathers. They are not to rise and inherit the earth and cover the surface of the world with cities. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers will never be renowned. You, different authorities will see this slight, as he's refocusing on the king of Tyre in a more local sense. That's one view. And that's, that's, that could be what's going on here. Under Darius Hestapus, the pretenders falsely claim descent from Belshazzar's father, Nabonidus. So there is a way you can apply this to the local uh, politics, if you will. Prepare slaughter for his children and the iniquity of their fathers, and they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. So let's see now ISV picks up it as another topic, Babylon, going, Babylon's desolation here. I will rise up against them, declares the Lord of the heavenly armies, and I will eliminate from Babylon her name and her survivors, her offspring and descendants, declares the Lord. And I'm going to make it a possession of the hedgehog, pools of water. I'll sweep the, with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord of the heavenly armies. The Lord of the heavenly armies has sworn, surely as I have planned, that's what I, she will become, and just as I have determined, so will it remain to crush the Assyrian in my land and on my mountains. I will trample him down. His yoke will turn away from you and his burden from your shoulders. What's interesting evidence here is that it's Babylon is going to be God's instrument to judge Assyria. Assyria was God's instrument to judge the northern kingdom. We talked about that earlier in earlier sessions. Here we're seeing Babylon rise and being used by God to punish Assyria. You get the, the echo of it right here. We haven't gotten into the geopolitics in detail here. We'll get into that in some later chapters anyway. In the English, for I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name, the remnant, and the son, the nephew, saith the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the bittern, that's a bird presumably, and pools of water, and I will sweep it uh, with the bosom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. As I have purposed, so shall it stand. And uh, the word, uh, the kapow, uh, uh, which is the Hebrew for bittern, can mean a porcupine, a hedgehog, or some shrinking animal. The term is, uh, 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 is, is uncertain. Uh, it's used as a water bird in Isaiah 36, and three, uh, it's listed with three other birds in Zephaniah 2.4, so it has a, a bird-like quality, but the precision is, is, is lacking here. That I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot, and then shall his yoke depart from off of them, and his burden depart off of their shoulders. There's the term Assyrian again. And Babylon was used in God's judgment on the Assyrian, but again, both Babylon and Assyrian are also going to become metaphors of the enemies of God in the end times in the eschatological sense. And the Assyrian is all through the scriptures. There's a list of your verses. You can chase that down. The first world ru ruler was an Assyrian. We believe that the Antichrist may also be an Assyrian. So the term may be just metaphorical or it may be very precise. And, uh, and the yoke here fits the, exactly the... I won't get into the geopolitics because we're going to deal with that in, in more detail in some later chapters. And then uh, verse, uh, uh, 20, verse 26 and 7... This is what I plan for for the whole earth. This is the, the hand that is stretched over all the nations. For the Lord of the heavenly armies is planned, uh, and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? Uh, in, the, in the King James, this is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. This is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? And notice it's the whole earth. It's all the nations. This is not just Assyria in view here. Don't let the language blind you uh, into being too myopic here. It's the entire world system at the end times that is the subject of these passages. And it's easy for us to get very myopic here if we're not careful. That's what I'm trying to uh, do here. Now there's a little, uh, there's a few verses here that talk about uh, uh, Philistia, and then I'm going to give you a summary as we have time here. So let's, uh, let's deal with the Philistia. In the, in the um, ISV, starting verse 28, in the year the king Ahaz died, this times the whole thing for you, uh, this message came. Don't rejoice, all of you Philistines. 
that the rod that struck you is broken because of the snake's root, a viper will spring up, and its offspring will be a darting poisonous serpent. The firstborn of the poor will find pasture, and the needy will lie down in safety. But I'll kill your root by famine, and I'll execute your survivors. Wail, you gate, cry out, you city, melt away, all you Philistines. For smoke comes from the north, and there's no one to take measure in its festivals. How will they answer the messengers of the nation? The Lord has founded Zion, and in it the afflicted among his people will find refuge. There's one thing about the ISV, you get a little better feeling of the flow. They capture the, the eloquence that you can sense is behind the uh, translation. Let's look at the pieces in the King James. In the year that Ahaz died, this was, was this burden. Rejoice not, you whole Palestina, is the way it is in the King James, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken, for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cuctus, and his fruit shall be <coughs> a fiery flying serpent. Palestina, that's interesting. That is the source word for Palestine. It was the Latin, the, the, the Roman Latin term for the Philistines, that gave the land, when they wanted to give it a name that was non-Jewish, that's the, the, the approach they used. So this is the term here that's used here strangely in the King James, and it may be that this has an echo far more contemporary than most commentators picked up on. And so uh, it comes out of the serpent's root shall come a cockroach and so forth, and that's the seed of the serpent, if you will. So this may have a, a, a antichrist flavor to this thing with the Palestinians and so forth. At the firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety, and I will kill thy root with famine, and he will slay thy remnant. Howl, O gate, cry, O city, thou holy Palestina, art dissolved. For there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. What shall one then answer, the messengers of the nation? That the Lord hath founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it. And there it is, the whole Palestinian. That's an astonishingly contemporary term to me. And I, I sit and, and set aside many of the commentaries, and I go through dozens of them, that obviously were written more than a century ago. And this term may have more eschatological, temporaneous, contemporary uh, implications than most people realize. But I want to stop now at this point. This, this finishes our, our, our primary thrust through these two chapters. But I want to step back and summarize what we think we know about the destiny of Babylon. That's really one of the key topics that underlies the whole session here. And what you should do, if you haven't done it, I want to again tell you to, there's, there's six chapters I want you to read. There are three pairs. And you write these down. Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 50 and 51, and Revelation 17 and 18. Those are three pairs of chapters, six of them. What I want you to do is find time where you have an hour, and I want you to read all six chapters at the same sitting, so that each one will be fresh in your mind when you read the others. And the, the Jeremiah passages are a little longer, so it'll take you a little longer, but the point is, those six, when you read those at one sitting, something will surface, and I'll show you what I think you're going to find. Here's a summary of those six chapters. Isaiah 13 and 14. Jeremiah 15.51 and Revelation 17.18 are summarized here in this chart. You'll notice many nations were attacking in the Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 15.51 and in Revelation 17. They have that in common. Okay. Israel is in the land and forgiven. Really? Yes. That's, that point is made in Isaiah 14.1 but it's also made in Jeremiah 4 and 20. But what haunts me uh, even more is the next thing, like Sodom and Gomorrah, that's an, uh, a, a uh, rhetorical device that Isaiah uses in chapter 13 and verse 19, and Jeremiah uses the same one in Jeremiah 50 verse 40. But here's the key thing for you to determine. This destruction will result in them never again being inhabited, even the bricks will not be reused. That's the term they use. I have one of those bricks in my office. Now that's in Isaiah 20, 1320. It's in Isaiah 14, 23. It's in Jeremiah 50, verse 13, 26 and 30, uh, 39, excuse me. And in uh, Jeremiah 51, 26, 29 and 37 verses. So that's three, so that's eight, ver eight times is that emphasized in those, by those two authors. 
the context of the whole thing is in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord hasn't started yet. Think that through. And yet that's the context for Isaiah 13, that's the context for Jeremiah 50 verse 25, and that is the context for Revelation 17 and 18. It's a literal Chaldean Babylon. This is not a, 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 a figure of speech. Both Isaiah and Jeremiah emphasize that it's a literal city on the banks of the Euphrates, the pride of the Chaldeans' excellency. Now when you get to uh, Jeremiah 51, he starts using some other language that uh, uh, he uses, talks about the king's fornication and how they're drunk with wine, and that's what Jeremiah uses in chapter 51, but that's also what's emphasized in Revelation 17 and 18 with Mystery Babylon. They're drunk with the wine, they're drunk with the blood of the saints actually. And finally there's a there's scarlet and a purple and, and, and a golden cup and some other f figures of speech that Jeremiah uses that are echoed by John in the Patmos vision chapter 17 and 18. So what I want you to do is read those six chapters at one city and come to your own conclusions and what you'll discover is somehow they're all related. Clearly Isaiah and Jeremiah are talking literally about a city on the banks of the Euphrates. What Revelation is talking about may be a little different. We'll get back to that in a minute. The doom of Babylon. I want you to understand the difference between the destruction of Babylon from Isaiah 13, 14, Jeremiah 15, 51. It'll never again be inhabited after it's destroyed. The building materials will never be reused. It'll be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. You got that in your mind? Okay. The fall of Babylon in 539 BC happened without a battle. That's what's celebrated in, in uh, uh, Daniel 5, and we're going to de detail that when we get to Isaiah 44 and 45, where God, it'll be very explicit there. It ends up becoming Alexander, Alexander the Great's capital. So it didn't get destroyed, he used it as a base of operations. It later atrophies over the centuries, but, is it, but uh, uh, 75 AD, the merchants are still trying to make a go of it. Uh, in the 19th century, the German archaeologist Robert Goldui uh, conducted extensive studies and, and, and hired local residents to help him. And so uh, the point is, and it's presently being rebuilt. Boy, does that do violence to the, to the biblical text, doesn't it? I'll give you an example of something. And Mystery Babylon is a whole other subject that we can talk about. Because that, that, it talks about the great whore in Revelation 17 uh, that rides the beast. Don't confuse the whore with the, uh, with the beast. The whore rides the beast. There's a classic study that if you're serious about this, you want to pick up Dave Hunt's book, A Woman Rides the Beast. And he really ties, at least in some level, the, the Mystery Babylon to the Vatican. Does a great job in research. It's all documented. Dig into it. She's called the mother of harlots and abominations. She's drunk with the blood of the saints. Many people don't realize that one pope in the Vatican, one afternoon, slaughtered more Christians than all the Roman emperors put together. You need to understand that the history of, the, of, of, of that. The Babylon the Great, the city, is what Revelation 8, 18 talks about. How the kings, the merchants, and those that trade by sea mourn her sudden destruction. King's merchants and those that trade by sea. It tells you that the root of that is world trade, interestingly enough, but that's a whole other study. Here's a, here's a picture of Babylon taken recently. Over that, that big mound on the left is a, a synthetic mound on which Saddam Hussein built one of his palaces. To the right there is the rebuilt ruins of the city of Babylon. Those bricks are being reused. I have one of them. Here's an aerial picture of that. Uh, over on the left there, you see Saddam Hussein's, uh, Hussein's palace. Okay? There's, there's the former ruins of the original Tower of Babel, they believe. But I want to take just that area marked in red and blow it up and show you a little bit more. There is the, 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 there is the processional way, and, and there is the rebuilt, not completely, partially rebuilt uh, ruins that large square in the middle of the palace there is the room that had the handwriting on the wall, rebuilt. And uh, here's, a, here's a close up of that even more, the palace of Nebuchadnezzar, Acro and the, the, the processional way. 
Across on the other side is the museum where they had the, the, the things that were uh, taken out of the museum for the big party when Belshazzar throws his big party for the thousand. All this is out of Daniel 5. If you want to get into that, get a commentary on that. And it's, it's very, very colorful. Now, the question about Mystery Babylon, is it a metaphor of the, Vatic of the Vatican? That, is what, that view is well supported and well documented by Dave Hunt's book, Owen Rides the Beast. And that's his focus. That's his focus. I think it's more than just that, by the way. And if you want to get a book, I encourage, I, I encourage you to get Dave Hunt's book, Owen Rides the Beast, very well researched. Or is Mystery Babylon the literal uh, city on the banks of the Euphrates? Now, at the pre-trib study group, once a year we met, and uh, Dave Hunt presented his manuscript before it published on the Woman Rides the Beast, and I was elected to do the rebuttal paper, because everybody knew I held a literal view of Babylon, and they thought that would be a counterbalance to his point. And I shocked them by indicating that I believe both are true, and they couldn't figure that out, because they thought I was going to attack his paper. I said, no, I think he's right on target. I just think there's more than that, and here's why. And I went into Zechariah 5, and I want to do that here. Then I want to talk about the woman and the ephah. And I'm going to take you to quickly, quick glimpse at Zechariah 5, uh, 5 through 11. Okay? And uh, the angel that talked with me went forth, Zechariah says, and said to me, Lift up now thine eyes, and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? He said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. And he said, Moreover, this is the resemblance through all the earth. And behold, there's lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. This is a vision that Zechariah has. An ephah was their standard volumetric measure commercially. Think of it as about a bushel, roughly, a big jar about the size of a bushel. A talent of lead was a standard weight, but almost 100 pounds, a piece of weight. So you've got a standard commercial volumetric measure, and you have a talent of lead. And what they're going to do here, they're going to take a woman, this is a vision, understand, a woman and put her in this jar and seal it with a lid on top. You with me so far? Okay. The ephah is the commercial measure, talent of lead is the, the, the weight. And he said, this is wickedness. He labels the woman wickedness. Okay. And he cast it into the midst of the, we, the ephah. And he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. So they take this woman who represents wickedness, seals her in this big jar, and puts a seal on the top. Then lifted I up mine eyes, and looked, behold, there came out two women, not angels, women. And the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and heaven. Bear in mind, this is a vision. But you need to think this is a Jewish vision. A stork is an unclean bird. So this has a, a ghastliness to it. Two women, the wind was in the wings, they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and heaven. And I said to the angel that talked with me, whither do these bear the ephah? And we have just one verse where the angel explains it, and that's all we know. Let's see what the angel said. And he said unto me, to build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Period. And nobody knows what this means. Check your commentaries. But let me tell you what I suspect it means. You need to know the history of Babylon. All evil, all idolatry started at Babel. Babylon, the mysteries, the, the priesthood there. Uh, uh, everything that is idolatrous had its roots there in Babylon. But the priests always follow the money. When the Persians conquer Babylon, that priesthood moves to Persepolis in Persia. When they're conquered by the Greeks and the Romans, that system moves to Rome. What you and I know about pagan Rome is simply Babylon's mysteries with Latin labels. And there's a whole study you can get into that. You'll be shocked to discover how much of our Christian traditions come from Babylonian roots. I believe what this, is, this vision is telling us. You see, the land of Shinar is the lo that's where Babylon is located. If Babylon's a city, Sh Shinar is the county, so to speak. Wickedness is put into this thing and returned to where it started. Where are they going with this thing? 
to build it a house in the land of Shinar, it, it will be established and set there on her own base. I believe the power system that is represented by the Vatican and much else, and a lot more, is going to get reconnected where it all started. Why? In order to receive the judgment that God has pronounced upon it. That's my view. Don't accept it because my view. Do your own study, come to your own conclusions. But here's my point. The woman of the ephah, here's the summary. The woman called wig and sealed in town of lead, carried by two women, two wings of a story, between earth and heaven, to build it in the land of Shinar, and so forth. I have the view that at Babylon has to re-emerge on the world scene in order to receive its, the judgment that God has said. Now, there aren't many people that share this view. I want to just warn you in advance. That does, doesn't mean I'm right. I just have this weird view. But I do suggest you watch your horizon. And I can tell you if somebody tells me one day that the United Nations is going to move to Babylon, our phones will ring off the hook. Because I've said this for years. I do happen to know, I'd be insincere with you if I didn't share with you that there is talk, there are white papers circulating the Beltway, of moving the UN out of New York. The, the UN wants to get out of New York. They're, they need more space. There isn't space there. Uh, they're thinking of relocating it. And there's, a, there's talk about where would you relocate it. You wouldn't, re you wouldn't relocate it to Europe. Paris, Rome, and London are, are rivals, not support, supporting. If you were going to locate the UN, if you were assigned to that, how would you go about it? You'd probably ask yourself, okay, what's the biggest challenge of the planet Earth over the next five decades or more? And the answer is energy. So one thought would be to plant, if you're, going to, if you're going to move the UN, why not plant it right in the middle of the oil patch? Put it in Babylon, where it would stabilize the economy of Iraq, the Muslims would treat it as a trophy, the Americans would be glad to get rid of it, and everybody wins. There are papers that let, 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 detail all the arguments. Well, those are just papers. There's always called papers floating around. That doesn't mean anything. There is a highly classified project to co connect all the fiber optics of Asia with the fiber optics of Europe in a hub. And that hub is not being put in Baghdad, where you'd think it would be for a lot of other reasons. It's being set up 50, 55 miles to the south, a place called Babylon. Why? Can't find out. It's highly classified. What's going on? Don't know. But I, want to, I don't want to sandbag you. I want to know there are some rumbles that finally starting. So we'll watch and see. And if, you, if it's something like that, I want you to remember you heard it here first, okay? But we'll see what God is going to do. But chapter 13 that we've just been through has introduced another major division in Isaiah's prophecy because from, ch from chapter 13 through 27, we're going to focus on the nations in contrast to Israel, of course. And uh, so, um, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel use the same groupings. And uh, both Zephaniah and Jeremiah, who lived later, used portions of this coming chapters that we're talking about. And this is going to include major eschatological metaphors we now see emergent on our horizon. You're going to be startled to realize how much of Isaiah's writings vastly transcended his day. We're going to see all that unfold before us. But we're also going to be, get, I want you to be sensitized to the idea that much of his perspective we're going to see unfold day by day, on our own horizon. So be prepared for that. So we're going to see the prophecies concerning the nations. We've seen Babylon in 1314, we're going to see Moab in 1516, and then Damascus, and then Ethiopia, and then Egypt. I think we can probably get that far next time. We're going to, these, these are smaller chapters, by the way. Don't be terrified here. But then uh, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Arabia, and then, of course, Tyre. And then we get to chapters 24 through 27, which some commentators call the Little Apocalypse. But this is a section of Isaiah that you're going to find very, very timely, very, very contemporary to us. So for your next session, I'd like you to prepare by reading Isaiah 15 through 19. That's a good chunk of those nations. They're relatively short chapters. You can probably, we'll carry it as far as we can. We might get to 20, but I think that's going to be a good bite. You? So with that, let's close with a word of prayer. <coughs> with a word of prayer. <coughs> 